In this video, we are talking about reducing induced drag. So we've seen that induced drag is a result of wingtip vortices, which create downwash, deflecting the lift back. We've also seen that these wingtip vortices are a necessary byproduct of lift. We can't just make them go away. So it's interesting to ask if maybe we can reduce their effect somewhat. The answer is we can, or more correctly, the engineers who design our aircraft can. The first thing that will reduce induced drag is an increased wingspan. All things being equal, a wider wingspan will result in less induced drag. This is because the wingtip vortices are further apart and they influence a smaller portion of the wing. As a wing gets shorter, a larger portion of the wing is near the wingtips and therefore strongly influenced by the wingtip vortices. However, the disadvantage of longer wings is that they have to carry larger bending loads. So longer wings tend to be heavier than shorter wings in order to have increased structural strength. One of the tasks of an aircraft engineer is to find the optimum wing length that reduces induced drag without excessively increasing aircraft empty weight. When we talk about wing span, we usually express it in the terms of aspect ratio. This is the ratio of the wing span to the wing cord, at least for rectangular wings. For wings that are not rectangular, the different shape is accounted for by defining the aspect ratio as the square of the span divided by the wing area. High aspect ratio wings are long and thin. Low aspect ratio wings are short and stubby. So high aspect ratio wings tend to have lower induced drag while low aspect ratio wings have higher induced drag. Next up is the overhead shape of the wing, which is also referred to as the planform shape of the wing. The planform shape of the wing also plays a role because it influences the spanwise flow of air. Rectangular wings and backswept wings are poor designs for reducing induced drag. Tapered wings and forward swept wings are better designs for the purpose of reducing induced drag. And finally, an elliptically shaped wing is the most efficient at reducing induced drag, which is why the Supermarine Spitfire had elliptical wings. Of course, each of these shapes carries trade-offs. Elliptical wings are expensive to manufacture and straight taper is almost as good. So many aircraft have tapered wings. Forward sweep, which is good for induced drag, is poor structurally due to the phenomenon called divergence. Back swept wings are poor for induced drag, but are good for compressibility effects, critical mock, and mock induced drag rise. This is why almost all high speed aircraft have back swept wings. Even increasing the wingspan has practical limits due to airport space constraints and the previously mentioned weight increase due to structural requirements. If there are so many factors causing designers to compromise on the plan form of the wing, what else can they do to reduce induced drag? Well, their most significant tool is the twisting of the wing. Twisting the wing allows the designers to vary the angle of attack along the wing span, which in turn allows them to optimize the downwash along the span to minimize induced drag. Wing twist, in which the wing tip has a lower angle of incidence than the wing root, is called wash out. If the wing tip is twisted nose up, it's called wash in. Wash out is by far the most common type of twist used. Wash out and plan form shape also influence the aircraft's stall characteristics. Sometimes a less efficient wing is used in order to promote safety in the form of a milder stall with better post-stall controllability. Lift and drag characteristics can be influenced by physically twisting the wing, but they can also be influenced by changing the airfoil cross-section along the span of the wing. This has essentially the same effect and is called aerodynamic twist. Like geometric twist, aerodynamic twist can also be used to improve stall characteristics and this presents an area of compromise with respect to efficiency. As the name suggests, 
Ground effect occurs when we fly close to the ground. Ground effect occurs because we get close to the ground, the ground acts as a barrier and prevent wingtip vortex development. The loss of wingtip vortices leads to a reduction in downwash, which redirects our lift vector upward, resulting in less induced drag and more lift at a given angle of attack. Ground effect theoretically starts at one wingspan off the ground, but it becomes progressively more pronounced as we get lower. Above about half a wingspan, ground effect is present, but insignificant. It's only below about half a wingspan that it becomes important. So ground effect is important during takeoff and landing, but isn't a consideration during most flight operations. Check out Pilot Effect's other video covering ground effect in more detail. Induced drag can be reduced by modifying the wing tip geometry exclusive of the remaining wing. There are three common examples of this, the Horner wing tip, wing end plates, and winglets. The Horner wing tip is simply a downward curved wing tip with a sharp edge near the trailing edge. The shape of the wing tip causes the wing tip vortex to move outward and away from the wing. This has the effect of reducing the downwash near the wing tip and therefore reducing the induced drag. End plates are exactly what they sound like. They are surfaces mounted at the wing tips that serve to block the flow of air around the wing tips, therefore reducing induced drag. As far as this reduction in induced drag is concerned, end plates are reasonably effective. However, they add weight to the structure and increase parasite drag by increasing the wetted area of the wing. Experience has led to the conclusion that the trade-off of higher weight and parasite drag for lower induced drag is not normally worth it. As a result, end plates are not widely used. Hey, quick pause. Did you know we have a flight planning app? It's called Flight Computer Pro. Get your flight planning done faster and get flying. Check it out, links are in the description. Now, back to reducing induced drag. Winglets are often thought of much like end plates because superficially, they look very similar. However, a winglet doesn't just obstruct the flow of air around the wing tips. A winglet is a miniature wing that uses the vortex flow to create aerodynamic thrust. A winglet is a mini wing, so it has camber and an angle of incidence, which is called the toe angle. The relative airflow for a winglet is a combination of the free stream relative airflow and the relative airflow induced by the rotating wingtip vortex. This relative airflow results in the winglet having an angle of attack. Combined with the camber, this angle of attack results in the winglet producing lift. This is where the toe angle really comes in. The winglet is set so that the lift it produces includes a component in the direction of flight. So the winglet effectively produces thrust. The thrust produced by a winglet is very slight. Further, the wing still produces some net induced drag. However, a winglet can result in a considerable reduction in induced drag, making it worth the trade-off of increased weight and parasite drag in some cases. That's all I have for you in this video. Please be sure to check out the links in the description. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful day.